uh, first of all, when we're talking about epic, we're not talking about the short fiction. What's an epic? Something like that. Oedipus is a play. It's a play, so it's not an epic. Um, well, Gilgamesh is. And Gilgamesh, you were supposed to have started reading for today, and that's an epic. So when you define an epic, you have a term sheet, so you're going to get to know this. It's a long story. We talked a little about the short tales last time, and the dis difference between a tale and a myth. A myth is something that was once part of somebody's belief system. Tales were more for entertainment, but also for moral teaching as well. They could be used for that. That's why you have the fables. And so an epic is a much longer work. It may be built around myth. Most, a lot of them were. Uh, and it may be built around myths of founding fathers. And Gilgamesh isn't particularly that because he's not the first of this civilization. But an epic is a major hero. So in an epic, you have a hero story, usually one hero, usually a hero rather than a heroine. Uh, sometimes you have a female who's the major one, but not very often. Uh, so what do the heroes do? A hero is an archetypal character. Meaning, yeah, it's a, a kind of a, a character that you find in many, many cultures. There's a hero. And that hero does things that are considered archetypal patterns as well, not just one thing. And what are some of the different kinds of things that heroes do? They save people's lives. They might save people's lives. That's what our modern view of a hero is. They fight villains. They fight villains. In ancient heroes, they're going to fight monsters as much as villains, but they might be battle heroes as well. So they might be head, um, the hero that saves the army, its army, and, and helps win the day. So there are battle epics that have heroes too. And they often go on journeys. So you're going to have a number of different features when you have a hero. Now as a hero, a hero is often an outstanding person. And often, like Gilgamesh, is going to be shown as being part God. Now, why do you think that a hero might be portrayed as partly God? Sometimes they have supernatural powers. Usually they don't. Now, Gilgamesh doesn't. Gilgamesh is supposed to be part God because his mother was a goddess. So, but he doesn't have supernatural powers, and he has strength, and he has beauty, and he has a lot of power, but he does not have um, a major supernatural powers. And because he is part human, he's going to die. He's not eternal, like a goddess, even though his mother is a goddess. Now, why do you think ancient people sometimes saw heroes as having one parent or the other that was a divinity rather than a human? Um, this gets worked into the stories about characters who seem to be more gifted than other people in many ways, <coughs> more outstanding, more strong. Uh, people start saying, well, maybe there's something in this person that's not just human. And then as the stories get passed down. Now, Gilgamesh was probably a real human king. The man who was his father appears, his name appears in documents. From They found some early documents with his name. So this is probably a real king, but he becomes uh, a hero, and over time, many stories are told about him. The epic you have, however, is layered together in a number of documents. It was found in a series of clay tablets in Assyria, in an Assyrian translation. But the story itself comes from a previous uh, culture, the Sumerians. And who were the Sumerians? They're not the earliest culture from the Middle East, but they're one of the very early ones. And so when you have the text of Gilgamesh, this is what it looks like. It's on clay tablets that are broken and partly missing. 
So remember when I sent around Sappho and showed you the kinds of fragments that they had? This, this particular edition of Gilgamesh shows you where there are the gaps. Most of the translations you will have that fill in all these gaps by using other versions of the story out of uh, filling in everything that they can. So this is what it really looks like. And uh, also, here's the map. We're talking about ancient Iraq. Ancient Iraq is the place where Babylon existed, where Samaria existed, the city of Ur, and the city of Ur. And so the place names are cities from the Sumerian culture. Most of the gods and goddesses are from the Sumerian culture. We just have a later version of this story from the Assyrians. And the Assyrians conquered this whole area uh, after a certain point. But they kept some of the same civilization. Shamash is still a major god, but some of the gods and names are just Assyrianized versions of some of the Sumerian earlier ones. Because Sumerian language was already not a living language by the time that the Assyrians were around. So we're talking about a really ancient part of the world. And earliest, well, I'll have this down so you can see what the gaps are. The translation. What kind of writing did they write? What's it called? You'll need to know this term. It's on your sheet, of course. Syrian, all of the three major cultures of the uh, Mesopotamian world, they use, they write on clay, and it's called cuneiform. That means literally it's wedge-shaped writing. Do you know why they wrote like that <coughs> instead of hieroglyphs? Yeah. Well, they didn't really have the wherewithal to make paper. They did learn how to do it, but they they had massive amounts of clay. They built their cities from bricks made out of clay. They did their writing on clay. And then, do you know how they you write on clay? You take wet clay, and you would have a tablet. This is like a student practice thing. They've actually found one where there's a teacher and students modeling, like kids following their teacher's handwriting. And it, you take what's called a stylus, S-T-Y-L-U-S. It has a pointed and an angled edge so that you can scrape lines on the wet clay and then you can angle them and make wedge shapes. So their language, their alphabet's going to be developed in that pattern so that <coughs> it is that the material that they're working with blends itself to. So back then, they were taught in school? They had schools pretty early on. We don't know how early. And it developed out of the, the, the ancient number system because they found tablets in the ancient Middle East dating back to well before the year 3000 BCE. So it, writing starts there before it does in Egypt. And it starts with numbers and records for businessmen. because and. They're going to, uh, massive amounts of these clay tablets they find are really business tablets they have to do with your property and your taxes and, and uh, trade elements. So the literature is scattered in there. The literary language developed a bit later. But they are going to develop a numbering system that then will get translated into Arabic. And eventually what we get, we call it Arabic numbers. This is well before that, but they have a system on so I'll pass this around so that you can see. It's no longer a living writing system, but it has been translated. Uh, I'll pass this around. So cuneiform is the form of writing that we're talking about. And they're now, uh, at Hopkins, they have a project on to try to digitize some of these clay tablets. Because even though there's been a great deal of destruction over time, the clay tablets they found massive numbers of these clay tablets in archaeological results. Far too many to actually, for one person to translate them all. So they were trying to digitize them. The problem with them digitizing these clay tablets is 
they, when they had the wet tablets, they did it on one side, then they turned it over and did it on the other, and they ran around the edges. So you can see that that made it a little bit harder to, to photograph and photocopy and put online. But they're working with these texts and trying to find more literary texts because they may be eventually able to fill in the gaps that they have in the Gilgamesh epic. But this was a form of writing that was used for all those major languages of the early Middle East, the cuneiform. And when you get to the epic itself, Gilgamesh, you do have a scribe who, who uh, is supposed to have put this together. He probably mainly did the introduction and the conclusion of the story. And his name is on uh, page 577, or I don't know how anyone will pronounce it. Uh, we're not going to worry about this. We'll, we'll treat it as though it's uh, basically an epic coming out of world tradition. And the earliest of the epics that were about Gilgamesh and some of the other things here, they were all separate epics. And gradually they got put together into one epic. So originally you had a Gilgamesh epic, and then you had a, an Enkidu epic, and you had a flood epic with a different person's name. But these all got put together into one longer epic. So they're built out of earlier traditions and earlier texts. So that's where, where it's coming from. Now, so Gilgamesh is a king. Any of the city is Uruk. This is near the city of Uruk, uh, and it's not too far from where Babylon was. Again, southern Iraq. And what's Gilgamesh like? We already said he's part God. 